Good morning. We come in our daily Bible reading the last chapter of the book of Romans, Romans chapter 16. Of course, Paul has accomplished many wonderful themes throughout this book, but most pointedly is the need for a Savior, the need to obey that Savior, and the need to understand exactly what God's offering, and yet at the same time, what God's expecting. In chapter 1, he emphasized in verse 16, for the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. Which is important because in chapter 1, Paul made note that while many people this may apply to, the Gentiles in particular had a problem. Although they knew God, they did not honor him or give thanks to him. That is, the Gentiles were guilty. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 would say, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That would include the Gentiles. In chapter 2, we understand that the Jews were guilty too of hypocritical behavior and teaching. That is, they knew the law, and yet they violated it anyway. And so, yes, Jews are involved in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the book of Romans is not just a downer. It's not just saying that we have no hope, but rather there is hope. That hope is possible in Jesus. We can be justified by his grace as a gift to be received by faith. In chapter 4, the book of Romans would make it clear that we are to believe the way that Abraham did. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. That is trusting that God will fulfill his end of the promise. And we go and serve. We go and do. In chapter 5, it was clear that Jesus did not die for us at a time that we deserved it. In fact, it's just the opposite. He died when we were weak, ungodly, sinners, and enemies. That's when Jesus came, and that's when Jesus died on our behalf. In chapter 6, it's critical that we combine ourselves, that we join in to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That is, through our baptism, we are dead to the old man of sin. We are buried and rise to walk in newness of life. In chapter 7, that means the separation, that we are no longer part of that old covenant, but part of the new. We don't keep the old law, that Jews need to recognize the law of Moses had a purpose. It pointed out sin, and it showed us what happens when we try to earn our salvation, that that cannot happen. And yet that there is this battle, even though we know who God is, the Jews understood who he was, even under the law of Moses. The spirit might be willing, but the flesh is weak. And in chapter 8, we understand that nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's so important that we always remember how critical it is to stay faithful to God because with God, there will be victory. And without God, there will be no hope, only destruction and despair. In chapter 9, questions might be raised then from the Jews. Has God rejected them? And that answer is no. It was always part of God's plan that the unexpected might happen because God doesn't think and reason the way that we think and reason. In fact, God has chosen that all man can be saved, Jew and Gentile alike, through the body of Christ. And it wouldn't just be because the Jews were perfect and he decided he wanted more perfect people. In fact, they were very flawed. In Romans chapter 10, we understand some powerful verses like faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Jews had heard, they understood, and yet the terrible and yet loving picture of God all day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people shows a picture perhaps like Jesus spoke of in Luke 15 with the parable of the prodigal son, that God wanted his people to return to him, and yet many Jews would not and did not. In chapter 11, we realize that Gentiles were grafted into the root that is the foundational tree of salvation that is in Jesus Christ alone, but that Jews could be there too. But also there's a key separating all of this. There are believing Gentiles and believing Jews as part of the family of the Christ. And what happens with those who do not believe? Well, they're not apart or they're cut off from the tree, depending on where they were. In chapter 13, we start understanding from chapter 12 even what it means to love. In chapter 12, love one another, serve with all that you can, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, never revenge evil for evil. Know that God will take vengeance. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That is to look to others and show them love. In chapter 13, the same way we love others, we need to submit to God, even when he says to submit to government knowing that God allows them the power that they have and that government does serve a God-given function of the criminal law system, to name one example. We also have to have love for one another, and that manifests itself in multiple ways in chapter 14, that when I have a disagreement with a brother in Christ, that I recognize that we don't just go separate ways, but that we work it out. And that if I'm the stronger brother, I don't lay a stumbling block before my weaker brother. And if I'm a weaker brother, I need to study these issues. I need to make sure I am fully persuaded in my own mind that I'm glorifying God the way he intended, not the way that I think or want him to have intended. In chapter 15, we recognize Paul, that he was a Jew of Jews, and yet he was a light to the Gentiles. That we as stronger brethren, certainly that Paul would apply as, we have to be willing to put ourselves down to help those who are weak. And if we're weak, we need to make sure that we're willing to take that help, by the way. But who exemplified best what it means to be strong and help the weak? 
Jesus. In Romans 15 and verse 3, it was Jesus who humbly came, humbly served. And we should learn from his example in all things and all ways. And so that is probably a light speed version. Some might argue with that definition. But of the book of Romans, we come to chapter 16 and note some of the last thoughts of Paul in this book. I commend to you to our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Syncrete, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Now, Paul is going to continue commending brothers and sisters in Christ. And what we learn is that Paul knows who are helpful servants. But if Paul knows that, can I get you to stop and think about one thing this morning? God knows who you are. He knows who I am. He knows who you are. And we understand in Romans 14 that we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Then Romans chapter 2 and verse 6, we will give an account of how we have obeyed. We will judge by, Paul writes, our works. What am I doing for God today? Because I know that he sees me. Is he proud? Am I living to his glory? Or am I serving self and giving in to that weak flesh? God sees. God knows. And let's just say this very plainly. God cares. He cares deeply for you. He cares deeply for me. That's why he sent Jesus to die on the cross for the sins of those of the whole world, Jew and Gentile alike. And so I wonder, as you read through Romans chapter 16, particularly the first 16 verses, could I be described by Paul in one of these letters if I lived in that time? Am I a hard worker? Am I a fellow worker? Am I, verse 5, reading also the church who meets in maybe my house? Am I one of the members of a church that meets in someone's home? Am I someone who is willing to serve others the way that Jesus so properly identified for us how to? In verse 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. We should care. The book of Romans shows us that we should care for God because he first cared for us. That's very clear and plain. But also to care for God means to love others sacrificially, humbly, recognizing that their good and their needs need to come before my own. What a blessing it is to have a family in Christ. And so we should greet one another with a holy kiss that is a greeting that is shrouded in righteousness and a love familially. In verse 17, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sassipater, my kinsmen. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greets you in the Lord. Gaius, who is host to me, and to the whole church greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Quartus greets you. I wonder a couple things. One of them is, in verses 21 through 24, would I be one of Paul's fellow workers? Would I have stuck with him through thick and thin? Would I be standing up for what's right, even when it's difficult and would lead to me being ostracized, perhaps from my family and certainly from the community at large? Do I have what it takes to stand firm in faith, grounded in truth, knowing that Jesus is worth it and that he is truly my Lord. Now, all this sacrifice, all this humility, all this love stands directly opposed to what we read in the middle there in verses 17 through 20. We need to be watching out for, the text literally demands that we not just react to, but proactively be making sure that those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine are to be what, verse 17, avoided. That means first and foremost, I have to know what the will of God is. So it's important that we read the word of God and let it dwell in our hearts, that we meditate on it, that we just know instinctively from reading what God's word is and his will is so that we can identify that which is wrong or counterfeit. There's no better example of understanding what is right than the classic age old example of how do we understand counterfeit money, right? In America, we have pre-printed dollar bills and how do we determine if it's right or wrong? But we have to study not all the fakes, but in fact, we study the original because by knowing the original, we can identify that which is inauthentic, disgenuine, or that which is falsified. We need to make sure we know what the true, genuine will of God is so that we can identify when it's been corrupted or changed. In verse 18, such persons do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. Why is this so important? Go back to Romans chapter 2, read verse 6 through 8 again. While we'll answer for our works, we live either selfishly like these who cause division or selflessly to serve God and have an eternity in heaven to await as a result of sacrificing our life in the here and now. And how is that possible? Why does it matter? Are the stakes high? 
Yes, of course it is. And here's the answer in verse 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. One interesting thing about the phrasing in verse 20 is the God of peace who will soon crush Satan. We don't often think of peace as being involved in crushing something. But we have to recognize that Satan is the opposite of peace bringing. He is selfish. He is the epitome of living for self, trying to tear others away from God. And so to have peace, evil and sin must be stamped out. To have a holy and righteous God, he must be blameless. And that means he cannot even look upon sin. And so it's important that as a child of God, I cut out sin from my life. And that when I do sin, I confess it and allow myself to be humbly praying before God that I can be cleansed, asking, begging for his forgiveness, knowing that he is a God who is faithful and just to his promises and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Sin is a serious problem, so serious that God sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. May we take it seriously, avoid it, and make sure that we're not crushed by God, but rather we accept his peace and can live with him forever. Verse 25, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made to known all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore throughout through Jesus Christ. Amen. Make sure that we appeal to and live out what verse 26 says, the obedience of faith, that we accept and obey the eternal commands of God and trust him always. The book of Romans is a powerful study with powerful themes, applicable ideas, and a lot of, to be thankful for. Let's pray to God today. Be thankful to him for his grace and mercy. Make sure that I'm pleasing him. Ask for forgiveness of when I haven't and when I don't, and for strength to be strong when the trials and temptations of life come. Praise be to God that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And let's be, make sure we read and accept the gospel as the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, the Jew first and to the Greek.